Good evening. I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, co-director of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art and co-president with Catherine Doge Rose of Phi Beta Kappa Alpha of Maine, Bowdoin's chapter of the Historic Honor Society. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this special event with Professor Corey Brett Schneider, Professor of Political Science at Brown University. He is with us tonight as this year's Carl F. Craner, Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar. We are enormously grateful to Phi Beta Kappa and to Mr. Craner for supporting this program and for all it does to recognize and promote scholarly excellence, qualities exemplified by Professor Brett Schneider's many achievements. Tonight's lecture kicks off his virtual visit to Bowdoin. While here, Professor Brett Schneider will participate in several classes and will meet with students to discuss their work and future career plans. I want to offer special thanks to Professor Andy Rudalevich, Chair of the Department of Government and Legal Studies and Thomas Brackett Reed Professor of Government here at Bowdoin for helping us to bring Professor Brett Schneider and for creating so many opportunities for our community to benefit from his visit. We wish to express our sincere appreciation to Hadley Kelly, director of the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar Program for all she has done to make this event possible. I thank the officers of Bowdoin's Phi Beta Kappa chapter for their service and extend a warm welcome to Phi Beta Kappa Senator Carol O'Donnell, who represents the New, England the New England District, and to other Phi Beta Kappa members, as well as to nominees of the class of 2021 who have joined us. Finally, we acknowledge with our thanks the John C. Donovan Lecture Fund in the Department of Government and Legal Studies at Bowdoin College for its support. Tonight we are in for a treat as Professor Brett Schneider explains the powers and limits that the Constitution places on the presidency in his lecture, The Oath and the Office, a guide to the Constitution for future presidents. In light of recent events, it is hard to imagine a more compelling topic. Following his remarks, Professor Brett Schneider will engage in public conversation with Professor Ruta Levage, following which they will open the floor to the audience. So in order to contribute to a lively discussion, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A feature. Although they will not appear to the audience, they will be visible to our speaker and moderator. Please also note that the live transcript function is available for captioning. And now let me turn to Andy Rudalevich, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Andy. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Anne, very much for all the work that uh, Phi Beta Kappa did in bringing this evening uh, to Bowdoin, at least uh, to Bowdoin via Zoom. Uh, we very much wish, of course, it could be in person, but uh, next year, uh, next year, we hope. Um, again, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Corey Brett Schneider here to campus. He, of course, is the Carl Craner Visiting Scholar for the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar Program this year. Um, and in his uh, normal life, uh, he is a professor of political science at Brown University, uh, where he teaches constitutional law and politics. He's also a visiting professor of law at Fordham Law School and has also been a visitor at Harvard Law and the University of Chicago Law School. I should note he's a graduate of Pomona College. Uh, now, I did some important research on Pomona on College Confidential, which the undergraduates and parents in the audience will recognize. And it informs me that Pomona is, quote, the Disneyland of liberal arts colleges, unquote. Uh, actually, the comment right after that said, 
I hope it isn't. Uh, <laughs> in any case, though, uh, as I uh, inevitably traversed the uh, the thread on College Confidential comparing Bowdoin and Pomona, it told me that both schools have excellent government departments. And I know this must be true because uh, Corey uh, wound up heading to uh, Princeton University for a PhD in politics and political science and uh, a JD from Stanford Law School. Uh, you may well have encountered him, uh, well, pretty much everywhere in the media. Uh, he's been on MSNBC, BBC, CNN, NPR, even on Sirius XM, if you're stuck in your car. Uh, most importantly, for our purposes, uh, his recent book, The Oath in the Office, A Guide to the Constitution for Future Presidents, uh, has been called Vital Reading for All Americans uh, by Kirkus, and it really is a hugely timely piece of work. Uh, we look forward very much uh, to hearing about it and, of course, to talking about it, to deliberating, to debating. Uh, and so without further ado, again, I'm going to turn things over to Professor Brett Schneider. Uh, he's going to uh, give some remarks. Uh, I'm going to come back, and in keeping with the evening, I will abuse my executive authority and uh, uh, lead the conversation for a little bit, uh, but we'll be working your questions in throughout and of course uh, explicitly uh, for the last 15 or 20 minutes of our time together. So please do use the Q&A function, uh, ask those questions, and we'll get as many of them as we can into the hopper. So without further ado, Corey, please take it away. Thanks so much, Andy. Thank you, Anne. And Andy, I'm looking forward, of course, to the conversation between the two of us. And thank you especially for that great shout out. I hadn't heard that Disneyland comment, but I'll tell my friends, my former professors. And uh, it was one of the nice things about receiving this invite is I've always thought of Bowdoin as a kindred spirit with, uh, with Pomona. So I'm really looking forward to, I'm sure the same kind of conversation that I really enjoyed as a student at Pomona and that got me so interested in uh, politics in constitutional law and uh, the presidency. Um, I'm going to talk a bit uh, about themes, about how to stop a president, themes that relate to the recent insurrection and the cases around it uh, uh, towards the end. But I want to start with a very simple question, which is why would somebody want to be president of the United States? And you know the answers are simple. Everyone's probably thought of it. You might think uh, get to travel on Air Force One or live in the White House, the entrapments of the office uh, that come with it. You might think of your policy goals to end poverty or certain views about foreign policy, or you might just be thinking over the last four years, pretty much every day, you know what? I think I think I might be better at this than the current incumbent, I don't know, just a thought. But I'm gonna to talk to you today about a very different idea of the presidency, and it's one that's outlined word for word in the Constitution itself. Many public officials, civil servants, senators take an oath of office, but only one is actually outlined word for word, and that's what I'm gonna start with because it's going to go to my thesis tonight and to really the basis of the talk and that oath is found in Article 2 of the Constitution. Article 1 creates and limits the Congress. Article 2 creates and limits the presidency. And Article 3, of course, uh, creates the su Supreme Court and leaves open the possibility of uh, inferior courts being created. Uh, so here's the oath from Article 2. Again, spelled out word for word. Uh, the president has to say the first uh, moment in office, I do solemnly swear, you also have the option of affirming that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States and will to the best of my ability, preserve, protect and defend the constitution of the United States. We're used to hearing that every year uh, during Obama's second uh, uh, taking of the oath. Uh, the Chief Justice flubbed the words and they were so worried he wasn't president, they had to redo it. He went into the White House to redo it, make sure he was president. This is a constitutional and legal requirement, but it's more than that. And I really want to kind of focus on the structure of the oath. Notice um, the president is committing not to just do a good job or implement policy or cater to a, a political constituency, but to preserve, protect, and defend 
the Constitution of the United States, there's a limit that the Constitution places on the president at the same time that it grants a vast power. And even the idea of an office of the president of the United States, as I'll suggest in a moment, and faithfully executing the office, Article 2 also talks about faithfully executing the law, is a kind of limit on the office. It's a symbol of the idea that a president cannot do anything who he or she wants, but is constrained by the duties laid out in the Constitution to uh, limit oneself based on uh, the law and based on the Constitution itself. That's not how I got interested in politics. I talked about Pomona. I got interested in politics uh, much earlier uh, at the age of nine. I was uh, a kid from Queens, New York, and the biggest event in Queens of the year was called Queens Day. And my dad worked for a local politician. I got to march in the Queens Day parade. I think this is the origin of my interest in politics. And I was marching in this parade behind the mayor at the time who was larger than life. I'm sure uh, some of your professors remember him, Mayor Edward Koch, who was four terms elected to mayor of the city. And I was walking behind him. He was throwing his arms back. It was a hot day in August. We were all sweating and he's yelling, how am I doing? And all I could think about was how sweaty I was, how hot everything was in the middle of the summer. And he says to, an, to the politician next to him, you know, I'd love some ice cream. The politician snaps at this aide, says, get the mayor some ice cream, get him vanilla ice cream. And he runs across a field and comes back somehow teetering with this ice cream cone, not dropping it and hands it to the mayor. And I'm watching this hot day, the mayor, you know, starts eating this ice cream. And I thought to myself, you know what? I want to be mayor of New York City. This is, this is my career. I'm sure there was a future president. Donald Trump was from Queens. I'm sure he was looking on. Some people never forget that idea of politics, that it's about a certain kind of goal, a certain kind of desire, the ice cream cone. But the oath of office is meant to be exactly the opposite of that. It's meant to remind the person saying it that this isn't about you. It's about a higher commitment to the fundamental law of the country. And the best explanation, I think, still of the presidency, uh, I talk about it in this book, I'm gonna write about it in a future book, I'm so taken with it. It's the second inaugural of George Washington. Uh, it's 135 words in total. I'm gonna read to you almost all of it, which won't take very long at all. And you'll see, he lays out a very different conception of the office than the ice cream cone and the idea that we're often used to thinking about the president in terms of power. Um, and uh, just to set the stage, this is um, uh, not in a large building and the Senate was meeting on the second floor in Philadelphia. You can now actually still go see it in, um, uh, uh, in Independence Park, it's preserved. And in this small room, uh, you know, inaugurations weren't affairs where you bragged about how large your crowd size was. It was a intentionally modest affair, mostly with uh, public officials, members of Congress meant to convey a kind of modesty. And listen to what Washington says. He says, previous to the execution of any official act of the president, the Constitution requires an oath of office. This oath I am now about to take and in your presence that if it shall be found during my administration of the government, I have in any instance violated willingly or knowingly the injunctions thereof, I may, besides incurring constitutional punishment, be subject to the upbraidings of all who are now witness of the present solemn ceremony. I'm gonna talk about what that constitutional punishment that he talks about meant towards the end, impeachment, as I said, the question of whether you can indict a sitting president and how this speech might relate to that or not. Um, and, uh, but first, I just wanna point out something even more basic. The speech, the few words are all about the office, right? I've taken uh, this, I, uh, this oath, the dignity inheres in the office, which is above the particular occupant. And the idea is I have to live up to this office and to the oath, which in turn is about the constitution, an idea from the beginning of restraint. So how is it that we can think about the restraint of the president? Um, uh, 
there is a very different idea of the presidency that um, a scholar, a friend of mine, and sometimes co-author now, Jeffrey Toulis, talks about in his terrific book, The Rhetorical Presidency. And he notes the difference between the kind of constitutional constraint you get in early America, including in this speech, and the kind that really Woodrow Wilson brings about. Uh, partly, Toulis traces it to the press office, uh, to the creation of the press office during the Roosevelt administration, what's sometimes called uh, the bully pulpit, uh, the ability to use the press here. Uh, but really, it's Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, who expands that idea of the president as a leader, who's able to rally the American people through the bully pulpit and push for legislation to, to come through directly, not through a kind of equality with uh, uh, co Congress, but as a first among equals. Uh, but I think what I want to focus on, just going back to the oath, is the notion of preserve, protect, and defend. If there is this new power, it's not going away, by the way, it's only increased with Twitter. Uh, the bully pulpit was always mediated through that press office. Donald Trump showed, at least while he was on Twitter as president, you could bypass it, speak directly to the American people. It's an amped up version of the bully pulpit. But with that power, that increased power has to come responsibility, has to come a kind of respect for the Constitution. And I think when you think of uh, Wilson in particular in the bully pulpit, you really see a travesty from the beginning in the making. Uh, Wilson not only hosts uh, the film Birth of a Nation, celebrating the birth of the Ku Klux Klan in the White House, he's quoted in the film repeatedly at length. And when you look very closely at the film and his textbook, uh, written as a professor at Princeton University, the film reflects in many ways scenes that he had described that uh, at minimum condone, maybe even glorify, in my view, uh, the Ku Klux Klan. So, um, you know, this is from the beginning a sign of the danger of the bully pulpit, a sign of how it could go awry. And uh, courts are not going to enforce this limit. Uh, they're not going to say to a president that uh, he or she has to abide by respect, for instance, and this was a failure, I should say, to respect the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. But presidents who really take the oath seriously, uh, at least in this respect, sometimes get it right. And uh, I could think in particular uh, of George Bush talking about Islam as a religion of peace after 9-11, rather than stoking the potential dangerous uh, 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 sentiment that was out there after 9-11. The bully pulpit also, I think, becomes even more important when we think about the obligation of a president to respect the Bill of Rights. And in particular, the First Amendment, the first of the 10 amendments that are known as the Bill of Rights guarantees uh, that Congress won't abridge freedom of speech, and that's been incorporated to apply beyond the Congress to local government and to presidents as well. Our first president did not respect that part of the Constitution. Sorry, I should have said our second president, uh, John Adams, uh, uh, was very different than this idea of calling for uh, upbraidings or criticism. Far from inviting it, he signs the Alien Sedition Act. And then as I'll talk about in this, this book that I've mentioned that I'm doing as a sequel to this, uh, really worked uh, with his uh, uh, attorney general to prosecute political enemies. Uh, in the 20th century, after um, New York Times versus Sullivan, there is no question that that was an unconstitutional uh, use of presidential power. Presidents have to respect their critics. They have to respect dissenters, especially when it comes to the criminal law, another place that Woodrow Wilson failed. Uh, but what that also means, going back to the theme of white supremacy, which I've already touched on, is that in our country, the current understanding of the First Amendment is that it protects all viewpoints, including white supremacist ones. And for an explanation of why that is, uh, think of Alexander Micklejohn's famous metaphor of a town meeting. He says, if we're all in a town meeting, we have to hear the most false arguments, the most wrong arguments in order to reject them. Uh, so if you think in Mickel John's case, take an easy example, if we're in a town meeting and we're debating whether to build a bridge on the north side of town or the south side of town, this is my example, not his, and the moderator of the meeting starts to say, you know, I don't like those people in the south side of town saying uh, why we shouldn't build the bridge 
uh, who want to argue for the south side of town, uh, why that we should build the bridge there, that's nonsense. You can't just shut down that speech, even though it's obviously wrong. Uh, so a president has to contend not only with critics, but with ideologies that are antithetical to the idea of the Constitution, the idea of equal protection under law. And white supremacy certainly fits that bill. But that only puts more pressure on the power of the bully pulpit, on the ability of the, of the president, the obligation to speak up for the Constitution and condemn white supremacy. And that's why, to my mind, one of the worst moments of the last four years was in Charlottesville, when the president talked about there being good people on both sides. It wasn't just a, a, a bad statement. It was really, to my mind, a failure of the duty to, to condemn uh, opponents of the Constitution, even while, and this is the tricky part, we don't imprison them. We protect their rights to free speech. Uh, I mentioned George Bush as an example of somebody who did live up to that. Another interesting moment is in the Obama administration. Obama is contending with riots that are breaking out around the world because uh, a, a Koran has been burned uh, in California. There's also a movie depicting the uh, prophet Muhammad in, in, uh, in, um, uh, as a criminal. And Obama does not shut down the speech. Instead, he sponsors ads around the world that proclaim the idea that we both protect this speech, but also condemn it, that he condemns it as president. Uh, so that's an idea that won't be enforced by courts. Uh, there are other parts of the Constitution that courts certainly should enforce, in my view, but they often don't. And when courts don't act, in my view, Presidents have to step up. It's crucial that they do. Uh, one area is the Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment bans, quote unquote, cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, but originalist interpreters of the Constitution, those who read the text as it was originally understood um, or originally meant, such as Justice Scalia have argued, and successfully, I should say, Scalia's view is dominant now on the Supreme Court on this issue in particular. Uh, that the Eighth Amendment does not apply to attempts to extract information. It only applies in instances in which a court has convicted someone and uh, they have sentenced that person to prison. You couldn't then torture them, for instance. But torture in order to get information, in particular, I'm thinking about post 9-11, the Eighth Amendment is not a constraint, according to Scalia's originalist view, I should say, I just think that gets it wrong. The Eighth Amendment in its origin is tied to the British Bill of Rights. In fact, the language is copied exactly from the British Bill of Rights, which was meant to stop unusual punishments by the king, uh, cruel and unusual punishments by the king. And in particular, they were thinking about things that uh, monarchs had done like branding individuals or ear chopping. And those cruel and unusual punishments were which were meant to convey that the subject was beholden to the king at his or her absolute, at the king's absolute behest. Uh, the framers rejected that in incorporating the, the language of the Bill of Rights. The British Parliament had rejected it. And so the idea that it wouldn't apply to the president, the uh, head of state or equivalent of um, of the king, uh, although even more limited in power, that the president would be unlimited where the king was limited, I think is just wrong. But with courts are not going to act here and in many other matters, that puts again pressure on the president to go beyond what's required by courts. Uh, and that conveys an idea of the unique responsibility of the presidency when it comes to the Constitution. Another area that I'm happy to talk more about that I actually did work on, I was a co-author of an amicus brief that was cited, unfortunately, by the dissent in the travel ban case, talked about the idea, what we were arguing is that under the uh, 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, which I've mentioned a lot, and under the First Amendment Protections of Religious Freedom, uh, a president can't engage in animus towards a particular group based on their religion or ethnicity. And uh, the court has said that many times in other areas, for instance, Justice Kennedy, to whom we were trying to appeal, in fact, we got a Kennedy clerk to uh, do a lot of the drafting uh, with the thought that Kennedy would see his name. And um, uh, what we were 
uh, conveying is that uh, in gay rights, uh, the court had been very clear that a Colorado plebiscite that showed animus uh, by uh, rejecting all rights all in housing, employment for gay people, that that logic surely applied here in the case of the First Amendment where Muslims were being targeted. And we knew that because the president told us repeatedly that he wanted a complete and total shutdown of Muslim immigration. They tried to change the travel ban. We did this over a course of several different iterations. Eventually, they put in North Korea uh, as a way of showing this wasn't anti-Muslim animus. I'll just give you a quick fact. Four people came to the United States the year before this ban was enacted from North Korea. And of course, uh, the CIA wanted to talk to all of them because they had information. The idea that you would need a travel ban of North Korea was a clear ruse to try to hide the animus. Yet the court didn't do what we said in this animus uh, brief. And more often than not in American history, that's the case. The courts fail to enforce the Constitution. But it doesn't mean that the travel ban was constitutional or consistent with the oath of office. So I've talked about obligations of presidents and certainly presidents who have failed to respect those obligations under the Constitution, failed to respect the uh, second inaugural, the, the presidential test that's set up by Washington. Um, what do you do when a president fails to respect the Constitution? We've just had a case study in it. I'm not going to be coy. This book was originally titled Trump versus the Constitution, but I, I wanted to expand it to think about the issues more broadly. Um, and um, uh, uh, we have to think very seriously, I think, now about that possibility when, when courts are not going to stop a president, as more often than not is the case, how, how Americans, how citizens can step up. One example is found in that Alien and Sedition Acts case that I mentioned during the second presidency, during John Adams' uh, one term as president. Uh, Adams uh, enacted the Alien and Sedition Acts, and uh, they were crafted in the following way. Uh, you could go to jail for criticizing the president of the United States, but there was no such provision outlawing criticism of the vice president. Now, why would that be? The vice president, of course, was Thomas Jefferson, a member of a different party because of the way presidential elections worked at the time. You could have your rival there. And uh, he was a member of the opposing party of the Democratic Republicans who were being targeted by the acts. What Madison, sorry, what um, uh, Jefferson did as vice president is go with James Madison, really the crafter of the Bill of Rights of the First Amendment, back to Virginia, back to uh, Monticello, his home. And the two of them, actually, he met Madison along the way going home from Philadelphia to Monticello. And they began to talk and plot how they were going to resist the acts. And they wrote the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which essentially says Jefferson at first wanted them to nullify federal law. Madison convinced them that was a bad idea. States couldn't do that. Instead, what they came up with was a proclamation, essentially, that these acts were unconstitutional. Uh, saying that as citizens, as members of the state house, uh, but also they were uh, going to commit to not comply with the federal government when it came to locking people up. In the book, uh, um, I'm hoping, I know some of you have read it and uh, looking forward to talking to you about it. Um, I talk about Miguel Marquez, who uh, was one of the first Latino judges on a court in California. And he resigns to go back to Santa Clara County. And he brings one of the most important lawsuits of the Trump era, uh, denying that um, uh, the executive order, which says that local government has to hold suspected undocumented people for 72 hours until ICE can come pick them up. He says that's not constitutional under the 10th Amendment. And I argue he's echoing Madison and Jefferson. There's an ugly tradition of states' rights resisting civil rights laws, resisting abolitionist uh, calls. Uh, but what Marquez is doing is saying that local government can actually defend the First Amendment, can defend the Constitution, in this case, defend the Equal Protection Clause, just as Madison and Jefferson had defended uh, the Free Speech Clause. I think we saw during the Trump era that progressives have to care, too, about states' rights. What about imprisonment? That is a huge question. I wrote this piece of this book. An article for the Washington Post, can a sitting president be indicted? That will never happen. Well, it turns out that the 
Uh, district attorney in Manhattan, Cyrus Vance, was very seriously considering it. He didn't do it. He did issue a subpoena on Trump during uh, uh, his presidency. But there are memos, uh, one written during the Nixon administration by his Office of Legal Counsel and other written during uh, the Bill Clinton administration by his Office of Legal Counsel. And what those memos say is that sitting presidents can't be indicted. In the Nixon memo, it's partly about the dignity of the uh, presidency. In the Clinton memo and in the Nixon memo, they talk about the unique power and importance of the president, the head of an executive branch over 2.5 million people are in the executive branch. The president would be debilitated and the government would cease to function. That's the argument there. But I argue in the book, and I argued in reference to Trump, that first of all, these memos are not the Constitution. They're written from the inside of a presidential administration. And while the Office of Legal Counsel is supposed to be independent of the president himself and to render independent decisions, I thought this is way too in the uh, ballpark of aggrandizing presidential power. Think of the second inaugural. It's all about the idea that the dignity doesn't inhere in the person. It inheres in the office. And even if Washington didn't think a sitting president could be indicted, the idea that he's giving us certainly tells us that yes, uh, if we're going to protect the office, that means protecting the rule of law. Uh, US versus Nixon was brought um, by um, uh, uh, special counsel and also his assistant, Philip Lacavara, who talked about the fact that they just thought these memos written in one little office were, were wrong. They were aiming to at least make it possible to indict a sitting president. And Lacavara argued a case called U.S. versus Nixon uh, that was about whether or not an unindicted co-conspirator, as they called Nixon at that moment, could be subject to a criminal subpoena. And really, I can sum up that whole case eight to zero with Rehnquist uh, recusing himself because he had been in the uh, executive branch in the Nixon administration. Uh, it can be summed up with one statement. A president can't refuse a subpoena because he or she is not above the law. And in Clinton versus Jones, the Supreme Court repeated that, allowing the president to be subject to um, a private subpoena. There is case law in the other direction. A case called Fitzgerald talks about uh, the need to insulate the president in his or her official decisions. Um, uh, what about the insurrection? Could Trump have been indicted at the time for the insurrection? The Justice Department is still controlled by these memos. They couldn't have done it, but maybe the Attorney General of Washington, D.C. could have done it. I actually uh, 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 wanted him to do it. I had written pieces that talked about why he could do it. He didn't do it while he was in office. But to my mind, uh, even Fitzgerald, uh, Nixon versus Fitzgerald, the case about the immunity of the president for official acts while president from private lawsuits, talks about the president only being immune within the outer perimeter of official acts. But that call for an insurrection was well outside the uh, outer perimeter, sorry, as, as Fitzgerald talks about. It was a criminal act and nothing in the Constitution, certainly no text, presents a, prevents a president from being indicted. My last subject is uh, impeachment. Donald Trump uh, has been impeached twice. Uh, that's half of all uh, complete impeachments. Nixon resigned before the full House impeached him. He, uh, there were articles of impeachment voted up in the uh, House Judiciary Committee. He resigned knowing, seeing the writing on the walls. But instead of talking about Trump or Nixon, I want to talk about uh, Andrew Johnson in the 19th century. Uh, who was indicted on a number of counts, most of them very technical, having to do with his firing of um, the Secretary of War, Stanton, a holdover from the Lincoln administration. And the argument was that Congress had passed a law protecting Stanton from being fired, and yet Johnson did it anyway. And the vast bulk of the articles of impeachment against Johnson concerned that very technical matter, which is probably already putting you to sleep. But Frederick Douglass, uh, dissented from that way of thinking. His point was Johnson is a white supremacist president. He's traveled the country making racist speeches about why even if we don't bring back slavery, it's essential that white people rule the country after the Civil War. Uh, he opposed, uh, uh, late in his term, the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. And I take from uh, uh, Frederick Douglass and his piece, in particular in the Atlantic Monthly, uh, calling 
uh, the president out on his white supremacy, that really that's what should have been done in the Johnson impeachment. It's so misunderstood because of the way they did do it. They turned this into a legalistic exercise, but the criteria of impeachment is high crimes and misdemeanors. 50% of the House uh, is needed to impeach a president, then two thirds to convict in the Senate. And the standard, did the president commit um, treason, bribery, or a high crime and misdemeanor? That is not a criminal law category. I took 1L criminal law. Many of you will take it if you go to law school and you'll see there is no part of criminal law called high crimes and misdemeanors. It's not on the syllabus, not in any case book. It refers instead to the office, to a demeaning of the office to a lowering. And in the British parliament, there was the ability not to impeach the king, of course, but to impeach the king's advisors who were leading the king astray. And the idea wasn't that they had to commit crimes, but that if they were derelict in their duty, and to me, Douglas's point was, we've just fought a civil war. The whole point of it now, what the legacy of that war is, is to demand an end, not just of slavery, but of white supremacy, of subordination based on race. And if we're going to reclaim that idea of the 13th Amendment, which has been so brutally neglected by this president, a president who vetoed a civil rights bill that talked about equal protection and then opposed it when uh, the Congress tried to put that into law, who opposed certainly voting rights for uh, African Americans at the time, that the dereliction of duty was so bad that that really should have been the reason for the impeachment. And the whole thing I told you about Stanton that I said maybe put you to sleep was all about white supremacy. Stanton was trying to preserve the Lincoln administration's efforts at reconstruction against a white supremacist president, uh, giving out land grants, uh, creating schools, and the battle between him and the president was precisely about making good on the promises, not just of the end of slavery, but the end of subordination. That should have been the topic. And I do think as a final thought that we have made a mistake with both of these impeachments in not making them more fundamentally about the violations of the oath of office. Uh, they've been partly about that, but in particular the first impeachment, which really focused on the Ukrainian phone call as bad as that was, ignored part two, for instance, of the Mueller report because of the argument about uh, indicting a sitting president. Mueller didn't indict him, but a roadmap was given to making that the issue. The travel ban, as I mentioned, uh, the fundamental opposition to the rule of law, I think, should have been the case against the president in both instances. And yet uh, we didn't do that. Uh, and um, I think that's part of the continual failure of that power uh, to work, to not broaden it, to really think about high crimes and misdemeanors. So I began with a simple idea, the oath of office, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, not the ice cream cone as much as I wanted it, this idea of a limited presidential power. Uh, we talked about the bully pulpit and the obligations of a president there, the complications of the right to free speech. Certainly a president can't shut it down as Adams did, but also has an obligation to protect and condemn uh, white supremacist viewpoints. Um, uh, we talked about the travel ban and the failure of presidents to act there and also in the Eighth Amendment case. Failure, of course, I should say, to enforce the Constitution, the duty of presidents to act. And then we finish with how to stop a president who disregards the oath, the role of the states in stopping a president. Miguel Marquez, uh, my, to my mind, the unsung hero, one of the unsung heroes of the past four years. Uh, indicting a sitting president. Yes, I think you can. That's the best understanding of our case law, the structure of our constitution, even the second inaugural and impeachment, it should be broader rather than narrow. So that's been a long tour through issues that I thought possibly could come up when I was writing this book over the four years, given who Trump was. Uh, you know, sorry to say, I'm not gonna be coy about that. Each one of them has come up uh, and, and even more uh, than we could have imagined. It's not unprecedented. There are examples in American history of what he's done, uh, but putting them together, uh, the culmination of the insurrection, uh, it was a frightening moment uh, for our Republic and all the more essential that like Frederick Douglass, who was writing as a citizen, that as citizens, we study these issues and that we call 
presidents to account. Whether you agree with me about the details is less important than that general theme. Uh, thanks so much, Andy. I'm looking forward to the conversation and looking forward to speaking with all of you over the next couple of days. Wonderful. Corey, thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, I think we're uh, just want to note again to the audience that the Q&A function is live. And so we hope you'll uh, put up some questions. There was a huge amount of material there for you to ask questions about and to deliberate about. Um, let me just start perhaps by uh, circling back to the very beginning of your talk, which was why would someone want to be president? Um, and you're probably familiar with the, uh, the repost to that very question by H.L. Mencken back in the early 20th century, uh, you know, great journalist, ironist, uh, cynic, uh, who said, well, actually, no one would want to be president <laughs> under the Constitution. And you kind of hinted at that, right? Because they don't get ice cream under your model of the Constitution. <laughs> That's no good. So how do we, um, you know, well, a couple of things. First, I mean, you imply, all right, over time, you talk about the bully pulpit in your book, and you mentioned it in your talk. Uh, Jeff Toulis, uh in his book that you cited, you know, talks about that as a second constitution, in fact, but none of that's in the text. Uh, so clearly there have been shifts. And it's interesting to me that you actually begin in the very introduction of the book talking about Abraham Lincoln. And, you know, we're kind of required to say nice things about Abraham Lincoln. Um, but it strikes me to, uh, to do so in the context of his fidelity to the constitutional text is interesting, because of course, at the beginning of the Civil War, he tosses out big chunks of the constitutional text in order to begin to um, rip off and retaliate against uh, Confederate uh, hostilities at Fort Sumter and elsewhere, right? He imposes a blockade. He calls up troops. He spends unappropriated money. He suspends habeas corpus. There's a whole list of things he can't do. And so I guess I want to uh, ask, uh, you know, how you would distinguish between the text of the Constitution and the values of the Constitution, which I think is something you come back to in the book. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, look, there's just disagreement about how to interpret the Constitution, and depending on the view that you hold, uh, you're going to have different assessments of, of these various powers. And I try to be very forthright in saying that I'm with Frederick Douglass and thinking that the Constitution is, the text is a starting point, case law can be our guide, but those things can't fully explain how to deal with the difficult issues that you're talking about. And so for that, I think we need to think about partly the structure of the Constitution. And that's why I talked about uh, the oath of office as a, 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 you know, a metaphor for the structure, uh, for the idea of limitation. Uh, and I don't think that words like cruel and unusual or equal protection can be understood either without opening up to a wider moral principle in which we think about these things. So when we go back, uh, I think the bully pulpit is here to stay. I don't think it's prohibited by the constitution. It's certainly not a power granted, but I think we can think about it still within the uh, constraints of the wider constitution. And so in just a simple way to me, a, a core, maybe the core of the democratic constitution after the civil war including the Equal Protection Clause, is a uh, rejection of white supremacy. And so that's why Wilson's failure, I think it's not the creation of the bully pulpit, it's the failure to use it in a way consistent with the call that Washington gave to preserve, protect, and defend. Lincoln is such an amazing example for people like you and me who are interested in the Constitution. I'll say a little bit about him. I'm wrestling with his text. Um, I'll refer to his Lyceum address before he was president, where he uh, talks about the fact that, you know, you don't want to be a Caesar. That's really dangerous. You want to be somebody who's constrained by the rule of law, takes the Constitution seriously. And in the beginning of his administration, uh, very early, certainly he's enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act, for instance. And over time, the way I see it, he comes to embrace a much broader, basis idea of the Constitution, not just this narrow idea of enforcing the law as it is, but of thinking about the deep values of the Constitution, thinking about um, the Declaration. Uh, think of uh, Gettysburg, the idea of consecrating the war with moral purpose. Uh, he's reflecting, I think, more and more moving from what you might think of as a, a narrow textual 
uh, idea of the Constitution to a more of a moral vision. And, and so I think we can criticize him certainly, uh, but see that he was living in a true emergency. I, I wouldn't want to extrapolate from what he did at the near collapse of the Republic to any old issue the way that many conservatives, frankly, like John, you do anytime uh, difficulty comes up. I think that was a unique situation. But more to the point, I think he, he deserves that praise that I gave him because he came to see the importance at that time of a moralized view. And part of what I'm doing in this new book is talking about the influence that Frederick Douglass has, you know, whether it was causal or not, he is coming to reflect more of a Douglass-like view of the Constitution over time. Now that comes with danger. Douglas actually told him, you know, I think that um, we should execute um, uh, Confederates in our, our, our control. That was Douglas's recommendation to retaliate for what the Confederates were doing to black soldiers at the time. And uh, uh, Lincoln resists that, they go back and forth. So I think they're learning from one another. Uh, there is a danger in the moral view of the Caesar, of, of the danger of dictatorship, but I think the, the bigger danger is in the kind of constraints. And I think the irony especially is that it's the textualists, the originalists who claim the so-called unitary executive, an idea that's really made up by Justice Scalia uh, in about 1976 and um, uh, heightened by my good friend and colleague, Stephen Calabresi. Uh, that's not a historical, that's not the true understanding of the constitution. I don't think that Jefferson or Madison certainly would have recognized it. Washington rejects it. Um, uh, so the more textual you are, ironically, the even more danger there is. I think the moral view has more constraint in it. But that's a great dialogue. Andy, you and I could go on, I'm sure, for, for hours on this. And we, we will. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, uh, so actually, I'm going to just bring in one of the questions from the audience quickly, sure. because uh, the questioner asks, um, well, you, you know, again, you're, you're okay here with Lincoln. You don't want to be a Caesar, but he's able to go beyond uh, the text and, uh, you know, get override effectively legal statutes. But in the book, you're pretty critical of executive action broadly. Um, for example, uh, Obama's DACA policy, uh, you know, the different executive actions that he announced uh, regarding gun control. Um, when, you know, where's the boundary there? What are, you know, how bad thing, the things have to be, I guess, in order to activate those powers uh, and uh, allow yeah, the I should say I really mean it that, that I think that Lincoln was unique in, in American history, that these emergency powers that the court rejects, as I talk about in the Youngstown case, there's no inherent part of the Constitution that it has these emergency powers. It's the dissent in Youngstown that talks about them. And as I say there, I think, you know, Justice Jackson is really a hero. He sees what happened in Nazi Germany with emergency powers. So how do we understand Lincoln? I mean, he's really, you know, rebirthing the Constitution. It's why it's a unique moment. He, he's like, as he says in the Lyceum Address, more like a founder than anything else. And I think anybody subsequent to that, uh, you don't want to draw on that example, that, that the idea of, of not just the text, that's part of it, but the structure, the morality of the Constitution uh, doesn't allow the president to simply act as he or she wants. Uh, in, in an emergency, the president uh, doesn't doesn't have that that power, and so there was only one Lincoln, I guess, is the way I'd put it. <laughs> well, look, I mean, in the in the book, you talk a lot about presidents being uh, humble in a sense with regards to their power. Uh, you note that the framers would be disappointed in a Congress that delegates its core powers to the president, yeah. and then a little later, actually, you recommend that presidents ought to veto. Uh, legislation that gives the president power that Congress should exercise. Yes. And I guess my question would be, is that even possible, right? I mean, we do think that, uh, you know, Madison, again, was right when he talks about ambition counteracting ambition. So if Congress decides to be unambitious, would we really expect the president to retreat in that case? And indeed, would that be uh, something we would want? It's a great question for this moment because I think this is the test and I think this is a president who might do it. Uh, as you know, and you've written about, there was a period after the Nixon administration where um, President Carter signed a law that basically allowed him to be subject to him investigation by an independent counsel. 
uh, the independent counsel, uh, Ken Starr, said, uh, unlike the Justice Department, that he had the power to indict a sitting president, Bill Clinton. He didn't do it. I absolutely think that this is a time right now, and it's one of the things I'm pushing for as we speak um, uh, on a regular basis for a new version of the independent counsel law. You could say, well, um, you know, Ken Starr was overly ambitious. Bill Clinton was right to allow that law to expire. He was an example of partisans hunting part, you know, hunting for partisan reasons. I, what I say to that is, first of all, we could talk about it, but I think that Bill Clinton, there's much more argument for an indictment of Clinton uh, for um, his impeachment, frankly, as well, than, than many progressives allowed for at the time. I think that the partisanship was made often in defense of him. Uh, but more important than that, I think it's more dangerous, we've seen this over the last four years, to allow an unconstrained president uh, than it is to uh, uh, allow an overzealous uh, uh, independent counsel. And so the way I put it uh, when I talk about this is that uh, it would be better to have 10 Ken stars than one Donald Trump. And I think that that's the right formula. <laughs> well, let me circle back. So this question of delegation, though, is an intriguing one. I mean, obviously, there are some on the court and, and many more in sort of the legal academy who think that, you know, non-delegation doctrine should be a bigger yeah. part of the way uh, courts anyway treat the administrative state. Uh, but I actually want to ask you a specific question because you raised it a couple times in your talk. Uh, I think in your book, the travel ban case had not yet been decided at the Supreme Court level. Uh, and you know your, your feelings on how it was decided are pretty clear. But let me, let me just pause it and not entirely as a devil's advocate that it was correctly decided, right? That in fact, you know, if it was meant to be a Muslim ban, it was hugely ineffective, given how many countries and how many Muslims it excluded from its coverage. Uh, and so perhaps North Korea was a fig leaf, but Venezuela was in there as well. Uh, and most importantly, you know, as the court ruled, you know, the Congress had decided, for whatever reason, to give the president a huge amount of power, right, again, to delegate its authority over immigration to the president's discretion. Uh, I think Justice Roberts used the phrase uh, exudes deference to the president. And, you know, if you read that statute, it kind of exudes deference to the president. So I get here we have two competing values, right? A congressional statute, and you're arguing that indeed uh, President Trump's words and intent as he stated it should count. But you know, if the president uh, says lots of nasty things, but the policy he proposes, in fact, at least after three iterations, doesn't do that, how can we go to the words and not the policy? Yeah, um, great. I mean, and, you know, I, I, I'll say a couple of things about that. One is that I think the dissent that, you know, frankly, was based on our brief by Justice Sotomayor, not only was right, but right now can and should be revived. I think there's a will in Congress and the Democratic Party to see that case reversed. And one way to do it would be to rewrite the statute, to pull back the power from the president to engage in uh, that kind of animus or discrimination at the border to enact another Muslim ban or to enact a policy that was mostly motivated by animus. So even if uh, the policy is mixed, it's a hybrid of some legitimate reasons and mostly, but for the animus, it wouldn't exist. In my view, it should have been struck down as unconstitutional. And on the case itself, yes, the statute grants broad discretion, uh, but and I think one mistake in the litigation was too much focus on whether well, there are other statutes that limit. I think, you know, probably you're right on the statutory matter that the broad takes over, but the Constitution cuts through any statute. Any delegation of power that is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause in Equal Protection Doctrine or a violation of the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment is unconstitutional. You cannot, the definition of a power being undercut is one that violates rights. So we have a whole jurisprudence of powers about what the president can do or not do or Congress and not do. And underneath it all is, that, is the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment and what it says as I read it, and at least as Sotomayor reads it, now I'm, you know, more power to you. The majority didn't say this. The majority said basically what you said, 
uh, I think it's undercut. It undercuts the power that you cannot use. There is no legitimate power to violate a fundamental right. And that's exactly what happened. So all the statutes in the world can't trump the Constitution. And, and that's how I see it. Now, the court didn't say that. There was a, a robust dissent. Maybe if the court switches, it's, um, you know, one of the worst things about that case in my mind is they overturned Korematsu, and yet they upheld this travel ban. Uh, I would like to see a subsequent case that says, no, you know, those two cases have to fall together. But even if there isn't, there can be a statutory reform. And I think if you say it the way that I just did, that this is law that's aimed to bolster the dissent in that case. Uh, we've seen that before. Justice Ginsburg, for instance, uh, lost opinions. And then you had the, in Lily Ledbetter, for instance, a revival of one of her dissents. And I think you could have the equivalent of the Trump versus Hawaii statute that would pull back presidential power to disallow uh, uh, executive action that either was based solely on animus or, or on a hybrid of uh, mostly animus. And it's true that there were campaign statements and that it was changed over time. And you and I could debate this, but uh, you know they cited, for instance, there was so much deference to, to them and, and we've never seen the report that they claim. They claim, yes, it was the same countries mostly in the third version, but it had nothing to do with the first version. We happened to do a study that showed these were the consulates that weren't participating. Nobody, and I've asked a lot of people has seen this study. I think they made it up. So, uh, you know, the so-called rationale, I think, falls apart the more that we look, look into it. Yeah, and there's also in one of the dissents, I think, some discussion of how the exemptions are being used, uh, if they were at all. Uh, but let actually is a give for eyes. This is a question from one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Van Vliet, who um, asks, you know, about the courts generally. You talk quite a bit about them, uh, and actually, I think. Uh, would like to see fewer retreats behind the political question doctrine, for example. Uh, but she asks, you know, can the Supreme Court be that arbiter? Can they maintain the claim of political neutrality when their positions, you know, for or against originalism are so tied to political affiliation at this point? And, you know, of course, the last, uh, you know, sort of the, the Garland versus Barrett, uh, you know, nominations give us some, uh, you know, leverage on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, there's no question that the, that the justices are engaged in value-based decision-making. But of course, in my view, that's what they should be doing. The problem, I think, is the denial of that, the pretend uh, neutrality of originalism and its radicalism. Uh, originalism at once presents itself as a neutral philosophy that's just looking at history uh, and then is radical in its um, uh, attack on political reform, for instance, and Citizens United uh, in the jurisprudence of um, uh, uh, interpreting statutes like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to be incompatible uh, with gay rights. Now you could go through these. Uh, sometimes, you know, there is also a split in originalism. There's a case about whether the 1964, now we're talking about statutes, but does the 1964 Civil Rights Act ban on discrimination based on sex apply to transgender people. And you see Gorsuch there break with his fellow originalists and use an originalist methodology to say, yes. Yeah. So it's not exactly partisan, but I think what's pernicious in originalism, and I mentioned uh, the other example of the Eighth Amendment, which is egregious, the failure of the court to stop torture during the Bush administration, second Bush administration, uh, its perniciousness comes from the claim that it's somehow just a historical fact inquiry uh, it is a value-based system, and I'd like to see that on, on, on the table. So I don't see any alternative um, right now if we just try to, um, you know, the, 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 the originalism is so ascendant, I think the way to resist it is through um, an alternative. And it's not an alternative that's not grounded in history. It's one that, uh, you know, the Warren Court used, um, uh, and its legacy in, in many ways was important. But I'm also not naive. I don't know that we'll get courts like that. Um, you know, just talk about court packing and we can talk about that. But I think as essential is that citizens through legislation, through lobbying, demand that the constitution be lived up to by the other branches. And uh, realistically, you know, the travel ban case wasn't going to be overturned, but one of the first things that Biden did was reverse it through executive order. And that is a kind of constitutional restoration of the kind that I'm talking about. Now, if the 
courts are going to be, I won't say partisan necessarily in a, in the, in a party identification kind of way, because I think that goes beyond what we're arguing. But um, you do expect the Office of Legal Counsel in the book uh, to set a high standard. You actually mentioned, um, you know, in the uh, in your talk, I think, a uh, place where they perhaps have not done so, but that they need to be, uh, you know, you know, better than the courts in a certain way. They're setting the uh, constitutional standard for the executive branch. Uh, and yet, right, we have, of course, seen offices of legal counsel who have been, you know, rather eager to find a justification for presidential preferences. So how do you make the OLC more independent? How do you get the president better legal advice or at least more objective legal advice? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, to be honest, since I've written the book, I've thought a lot about this and I worry that the institutional role of the Office of Legal Counsel, the more that I look at it, is more often than not to justify the decisions that the president wants to make and to aggrandize presidential decision making. And throughout history, possibly because it's located in the, in that, in the executive branch, it's played that role. Maybe we need you know, something more like the Office of the Special Counsel when it comes to the Office of the Legal Counsel, a real emphasis institutionally of independence, not having people move back and forth, for instance. Uh, and there is, you know, it, I'll be blunt about it. I mean, I've seen uh, Democratic Office of Legal Counsel heads, uh, counselors to the president, arguing against the need for a new independent counsel law, against the need for a new War Powers Act, which we haven't talked about, but which I say is another instance in which Congress needs to reclaim its power. We tried to do that in the in the uh, War Powers Resolution or War Powers Act, whatever you want to call it, the post. Um, uh, during the end of the Nixon administration, the requirement that the president get authorization from uh, Congress within uh, this limited time frame or withdraw troops, even if the president can initiate with uh, explanation. Um, but I, you know, I think that that's been a failure. It's increased the power of presidents. And the meaning of uh, declare war is initiate. And that means on day one. Uh, so. There's hope, though, I think, too, you know, outside the institutional question of I've strayed a little bit from the question of the Office of Legal Counsel. But one hope is is that it's not going to come from there. It'll come from Congress, for instance. So Ted Lieu has what he calls a first strike bill that would require that a president not launch a first strike nuclear attack because it's by definition the, the initiation or declaration of war. Um, but I think we've got to get creative about it. I think I was a little naive when I wrote the book about the hope of the Office of Legal Counsel uh, outside with reform, you know, good, put good people there or something. And, and I've come to think, no, there needs to be more constitutional constraint. Ironically, I think when I've been looking throughout history, when that role was more informal, it was friends of the president who knew a lot and cared about the Constitution, you sometimes got more constraint. And so, um, you know, uh, this guy I've met from my building named Clifford Alexander. He was uh, one of the first African-American advisors to Lyndon Johnson. I just, you know, it's one of these amazing things. We've had this kind of friendship and I realized it was maybe two years into talking to him. <laughs> and I was like, what? And uh, so I've gotten to talk to him and I've read a lot about him. And uh, you know that informal kind of advice maybe plays more of a role, but the truth is it comes down to, in the same way it comes down to citizens speaking out, it's who does the president have around him or her? Does he have people who are just gonna grandize power and come up with arguments that say, you know, here's how you can do this or are they gonna stop him? Ironically, I think during the Trump administration, many of the lawyers were the ones that stopped him. Uh, he told Don McGahn to fire, this is in the Mueller report, to fire uh, Mueller. And Don McGahn went home and just didn't do it. <laughs> of course, you had Elliot Richardson during uh, Watergate and Ruckel's house and others who defied the president. So there's something maybe about people of integrity um, and the pressure of citizens saying, if you do this, if you go along with this, where you you will face a, a life of rebu of rebuke. Um, and you know, John Dean rescued himself by turning on a president. I think if he hadn't done that. He would have gone the way of many of these other Watergate cronies who are rightly uh, looked at with complete disdain. And, you know, people like Stephen Miller, frankly, I, I, I think that's going to be their fate. Well, let me uh, wrap 
a couple of questions into one and make this our last question because we're running out of time here. Uh, though I do want to uh, emphasize, especially for there's a couple of questions left in the queue and uh, students, I just want to remind that uh, you all that uh, Professor Brett Schneider is going to be holding open office hours uh, by Zoom tomorrow for Bowdoin students. Uh, and so if you don't have the link to that, you can email either myself or Ann Goodyear. Uh, we'll make sure that you're able to, to chat with him at more length uh, at your leisure in, in a, a student only forum. Um, so please do that if you're in the queue and I haven't been able to get to your question um, and you are a Bowdoin student. Uh, so here's the sort of last question. Uh, effectively, you know, this is one of a bunch of books, right, that was written not explicitly as an anti Trump book, at least the way it came out. Um, <laughs> but let's face it, is an anti Trump book, and you, you cop to that actually in your talk. Um, so one question is, would you have been motivated to write it in the absence of Trump, right, the counterfactual, you know, would you have written something else instead? And then is it too early? Uh, one of our audience members asks, is it too early to speak about President Biden's understanding of and respect for the Constitution? Yeah, I mean, the honest answer is no, I wouldn't have. I uh, was working on hate speech, and you could see that theme in what I was saying. And uh, I saw that, you know, if you care about hate speech, white supremacy, when the president is engaging in it, uh, I, I felt like I better switch my topic of what I was writing about. I had been teaching all of this material for years and always liked it, like teaching it, was fascinated by it. But at the moment, sort of, I think that's really where it came from is the years of teaching this stuff. And it's the core of what we, one out constitutional law when I teach that. And also when I teach constitutional law at Brown is presidential powers is a huge part of that class. And so I saw that lining up with the civil liberties issues. And I thought it's fundamental to switch what I'm writing about um, one suspicion about that is, you know, you're catering your theory to this particular president, which is unusual. And uh, I think the test is the, the, your second question, you know, is doing it now in the Biden administration. And, uh, you know, people like, I'll just say in a blunt way, like Bob Bauer, um, you know, who have influence in this administration or former ad, ad, administration officials from the Obama administration who are going to enter this I want to see them talk about restraint, not talk about aggrandizement of power. Uh, I want to see the Democratic Party, frankly, realize its mistakes of the Clinton years uh, when it came to war powers, when it came to presidential power. So we'll see how I do. But my plan is to continue to say the same things and to, to criticize uh, Joe Biden when he doesn't do these things. Now, he started, as I said, he did revoke the travel ban. There's uh, talk of a new voting, voting rights act, which is a fundamental act of restoration of the Constitution, not doing that through executive order, but through legislation. Uh, so yes, I think it came from that. Uh, but I also think, you know, frankly, I was right. I thought it was a unique threat, Trump, that this wasn't a normal presidency, uh, that he was not just having bad policies, but that the white supremacy and the ideology was anti-constitutional. And there were people who thought that I was exaggerating, going too extreme. And I think the insurrection showed that I wasn't exaggerating. I think that was the moment of truth. It's rare that you get a moment where it sort of all comes together. But for me, I was sort of thought, yeah, that's what I was saying. So, uh, you know, but I hope that people will hold me to it. I'm going to try to keep, keep, keep doing this. All right. Well, we will uh, leave it there and indeed hold you to it uh, moving forward. Uh, so thank you so much, Corey, for your uh, talk tonight. And I want to thank you in advance uh, for um, the multiple uh, Bowdoin classes you're going to be visiting um, uh, actually tonight, right after this uh, event. Uh, so grab some water or something yeah. stronger if you want before you plunge into our virtual classroom, but also uh, tomorrow. And then, as I mentioned, there will be office hours later in the day at four o'clock tomorrow. Uh, for students who would like to, to chat with Professor Brett Schneider about any of the substance uh, he raised today or about other issues of their own research, things they're interested in, uh, in this general area, or even, you know, what do you need to do to get into law school? All right, very broad ranging. And Andy, thank you so much for this conversation to get to engage uh, with a scholar of the presidency of the executive branch on this level. Um, for a public audience, I can't think of anything more 
important to do. And I'm looking forward to more conversations with you, of course, and with these great uh, Bowdoin students who uh, uh, I'm sure are going to remind me of my time at Pomona. Uh, uh, you, uh, you kind of kindred spirit schools, I've already labeled us. And um, thank you all for these questions. Uh, it's really been, 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 been a great experience. And I'm really looking forward to the events to come to. Thank you. And thank you, Anne, for setting this up. Wonderful. Well, thank you. This concludes our Phi Beta Kappa uh, visiting lecture for 2021. And we look forward to seeing you back on campus uh, sooner rather than later as we come through the light at the end of the tunnel. Thanks, everybody, and good night. Thanks, Andy.